Hallelujah. Are you ready to get in the Word today and get, get cranking up? All right. Father, we come to you. Put me on as your microphone. Let's have church in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are starting a three-part series today, uh, Your Season of Significant Insignificance. Your Season of Significant Insignificance. Then part two will be your season of significant setback. And part three will be your season of significant supplication. And supplication means prayers, okay? So let's talk about significant insignificance today. Uh, many times in the Christian faith, you'll hear the word wilderness or walking through the valley. There's times you feel like God has taken you and put you on the back burner of the stove. You know how you do when you're cooking and you've got three or four pots going at Thanksgiving dinner and you got the noodle pot, you got the mashed potato pot, and you got the, you know, the casserole pot, whatever you got. But there's some things that you just got to take that they're going to have to simmer for a while and you just put them on the back burner, turn it on low heat, put the lid on and forget about it for a couple hours until it's nice and done. And if it's vegetables, make it about 20 hours. Cook all the vitamins out of them things. <laughs> Amen. Don't be eating raw vegetables. No, I'm kidding. But it's a season that every believer goes through. In our life, a season of wilderness, a valley, a back burner season, uh, it, it's like, ah. Just your faith feels like, Blah, like that. It's a season of delay where you feel like you want God to do some really cool stuff in your life, and he's not. It's a season where you feel like the heavens are brass. You're praying, and you know you're praying, but for some reason, God has turned a deaf ear to you. He hears Pastor Matt, but he doesn't hear me. And it's a season that we define as brass Heavens. Now, just before we go into any further, just by a show of hands, how many know exactly what I'm talking about? You've been there. All right, praise God. If you, if you can't raise your hand right now, you will someday soon. And because I'm message, it may be sooner than later. So I want to put this into perspective today. I'm not just talking about any wilderness experience, but I want to talk about it specifically in three areas of our life. Number one, a calling. Number two, a dream, and number three, a vision from God. Let me, give you, let me make it real. We have a lot of young people in this church. We have a lot of single people in this church. And when I, when I mingle with the singles and talk it up with you all, many times people share with me, you know, Pastor Matt, I am believing God to be married someday. Well, that's a dream, isn't it? I mean, how many of y'all know it's a good thing to be married? Amen. And if you're single and you want to be married, praise God, you ought to want to be married. That's good. And if you don't want to be married, praise God, you're really smart. You'll be rich someday. <laughs> but if, 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 you're, if you're single and say, man, I, I, I really have a deep desire in my heart to be married, that is, that is a godly desire. God put that in you. That's a dream. Maybe you're, maybe you're newly married, you're young married, you're less than five years married, less than seven years married, and you're young, and you have these dreams. You want to have your house someday, and you want to have kids someday, and you want to grow old together, and, 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 and you, 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 you want to have a career that you'll, that's notable, and you just can't wait for these things to happen. That's a dream, okay? Uh, many people over the years have shared with me a, de a desire what, maybe they felt it was a vision or it was a dream. Maybe they felt God calling them to some form of serving in the body of Christ. If people said, oh, pastor, I have this passion to work with children. Pastor, I have this passion to work with hurting women. Pastor, I have this passion to work with teens. Pastor, I have a passion to work with those in jail. Pastor, I feel like I'm supposed to preach. Uh, but I've heard people tell me over the years, many times they have a dream, a, 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 a call for missions or some type of thing God, they feel, has put in their heart to serve his kingdom, amen. amen. Maybe your vision is simply to get your spouse saved. Maybe it's to save your marriage. Um, maybe 
Now, let me tell you what's, what would be a worse problem than having a vision and being denied is not having any vision, not having any dreams, not having any calling. You need to have dreams, visions, and calling. And you need to be able to know what they are. And that's okay to know what they are. If you don't know what they are, you better spend some time with the Lord to find out. Because how many of y'all ever been, been on a sightseeing tour to go specifically? You, you know, we just got back from the beach and it was nice. And, you know, we love looking for dolphins. I love looking for sharks and alligators. But the one thing I really would never go out of my way to find is a jellyfish. Has there anybody been on a jellyfish tour? No, nobody cares about jellyfish. And if you're a jellyfish, you are a worthless <laughs> fish. And all you do is just float. <laughs> and wherever the current takes you, that's where you go until a sea turtle comes and eats you. And that's your life. Or you get washed up on shore and dry up and die. And someone steps on you and you get to inflict a little pain and then you die. Jellyfish just go wherever the current takes them. And you know what? In the body of Christ, we are not to be jellyfish. We're not to take whatever the world is, or whatever life is handing to us. The Bible says, Jesus, here's how I want you to pray. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our job as Christians is to make the will of God happen. And to do that, he gives us callings, he gives us dreams, he gives us visions that hopefully are bigger than ourselves. Thank you for the overwhelming enthusiasm of silence. I appreciate that. I'll take that as a message. But hopefully, you have something burning on the inside of you. Hopefully, you have something that says, you know what? I, 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 I've got to, I want to see this come to pass in my life. <laughs> And so, you seek it, and then God says, okay, here's your vision. Okay, here's your calling. Okay, here's your dream. Psalms 20 says God will give us the desires of our heart. Psalms 21 says God will give us the desires of our heart. One means he'll put the desires in there. The other means he'll make them come to pass. Okay? Okay? So you're saying, God, give me dreams, give me visions. He will. But then comes this message. Because then you get the dream, you get the vision, you get the passion, you get the calling. And do you know what happens more often than not? Absolutely nothing. Nothing, 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 nothing. Welcome to your season of significant in significance, being put on the back burner by Chef God himself. Huh. Thought I came to church to feel good, Pastor Matt. <laughs> this happened, I believe this is a true story, it happened with Delta. I don't know which airport it was. <laughs> but if you've ever been in an airport, sometimes you can go and get right through the ticket counter, and sometimes it just backed up for whatever reason. And there was a Delta line, and you know how they have the, they make you snake around, and the snake was completely full of people, and the line was just taking forever. And finally, there was a guy toward the back of the line, and he really had grown impatient. And he began to kind of make known to the customers around him he was not happy that they should have more people, that this should go better. And finally, he realized he was possibly in jeopardy of missing his plane. So he just cuts in front of everybody else and goes to the head of the line and goes to the next available ticket agent. And, and the lady at the ticket agent says, sir, you're going to have to step aside. You've got to go back to the back of the line. Well, if this is ridiculous. You're going to wait on me now. I want my boarding passage. Once again, she said, sir, you're going to have to go to the back of the line. Uh, this, this is not uh, you can't do this. And he said, this is rah, 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 rah. And then he said this, do you know who I am? And without missing a beat, that Delta ticket agent picks up the intercom for the whole airport and said, there's a gentleman at the Delta ticket counter who does not know who he is. If anyone has any idea who this man is, please come tell me who he is. 
Hallelujah. Don't mess with Delta ticket agents, apparently. And don't mess with United flight attendants, either. <laughs> Our t- key text for this series, Ecclesiastes 3.1, the Beatles wrote a song about it. For those of you in that older generation, you know this. To everything, there is a reason, a time for every purpose under heaven. And some conclusions we draw from that. Number one, seasons are always changing. There is no constant in life. About the time you feel like you've got the season of life you're in figured out, it changes. About the time as a parent you figure out how to be a good parent of a three-year-old, they become four and give you a whole other set of problems. And about the time you deal with four-year-old problems, they become five and then all the way to eight and then, and then 13. <laughs> Sometimes we are ready for the season to change before the season changes. I've had to stop going to the Indianapolis boat show in February because in February, usually over Valentine's Day week, they have at the, at the state fairgrounds a boat and travel show uh, and they put all these boats on display. And then over here they have all these motorcycles. And then over here they have this giant display a fishing tackle. And then over here, they have all these vendors from different resorts around the world. Come fish in Alaska. Come fish in Canada, eh? Come fish in Tennessee, y'all. Come fish. <laughs> and, and then they show you pictures of all these trophy fish that you're guaranteed to catch if you go to their resort which will be no problem because you can buy the tackle and the boat you need right there. And I used to go to this thing in February. And you talk about a rush. Oh, man, I'm ready to go fishing. I'm ready for summer. Hallelujah. I start getting my fishing box organized and oiling my reels, changing out the line. February 15th, man, it'll be here any day. And then what happens? Winter won't let go. Is there anybody else besides me that's been ready for spring before winter was ready to let go? And I had to quit going because it got me too excited and I get too stir crazy about March. Amen. So I just, I can't go anymore because I just, I just can't go. The other side of the coin is, I think most people enjoy the fall. Those September and October days, when it's not humid, there's a calming breeze, about 68 degrees, beautiful sunshine, not a cloud in the sky, and the leaves are beautiful. And of course, we're close enough to Brown County or Cataract Falls. We know what a day there does in the fall to us. It just makes us, <sighs> and it's one of the most enjoyable times of the year. You're like, oh, I wish we could have this forever. And then what happens? November. And last year, snow in November, snow in December, ice, ice, baby. And so, just because we want a season to continue or we want a season to stop does not mean that it will continue or that it will stop. God's timetable, we're going to find out, is a totally different timetable than our timetable. And lastly, the seasons are tied to God's purpose. The seasons are tied to God's purpose purpose. It says, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. So if you're in a season of significant insignificance and you're in the back burner, you're in the wilderness, you're thinking, God, why am I going through this? Why is it taking so long? Oh, God. And those prayers we love to pray so eloquently and full of faith and power But even that season of wilderness, that season, that's what we're going to be talking about over the next three weeks, 
These seasons are ordained by God to work out his purposes in this earth and in you. And so today, I don't know if I have time, I won't have time to get through all this, but I want to take some specific looks at seasons of delay, of insignificance with somebody's calling, with somebody's dream, and somebody's vision. And then either today or next week we'll come back and we'll show you how to apply this in 20, 000, or 2017 in West Central Indiana. And, and so the calling, let's talk about that. When we read the Bible, every person of significance went through a season of significant insignificance. When I look at great men of God around the world and through church history, they've all been through a wilderness. They've all been through a valley. They've all been through difficult times. And one of the, the most known is, is Moses, who had one of the longest preparation times of anybody. And uh, some of you, there was a movie made in 1956 called The Ten Commandments. And some of you may remember that. That was back when Hollywood still had 20% moral, morality left. And it's actually a really good movie. The, of course, it doesn't do anything with our modern-day technology, but, but the plot was excellent. Um, and uh, I want to show you a scene from that movie of when Moses is entering the wilderness. And I want you to listen to the narrator as, and listen to what he has to say. And it's going to speak exactly to this message today. So, Maestro, if we could hit that, please. And could you fast forward to about the 210 mark on that, if the it's possible? Who... Right there. Moses is entering the wilderness. Into the blistering wilderness of Shur, the man who walked with kings now walks alone. Torn from the pinnacle of royal power, stripped of all rank and earthly wealth, a forsaken man, without a country, without a hope, his soul in turmoil, like the hot winds and raging sands that lash him with the fury of a taskmaster's whip. He is driven forward, always forward, by a God unknown for a land unseen. Into the molten wilderness of sin, where granite sentinels stand as towers of living death to bar his way. Each night brings the black embrace of loneliness. In the mocking whisper of the wind, he hears the echoing voices of the dark. His tortured mind, wondering if they call the memory of past triumph, or wail foreboding of disasters yet to come, or whether the desert's hot breath has melted his reason into madness. He cannot cool the burning kiss of thirst upon his lips, nor shade the scorching fury of the sun. All about is desolation. He can neither bless nor curse the power that moves him. For he does not know from where it comes. Learning that it can be more terrible to live than to die, he is driven onward through the burning crucible of desert where holy men and prophets are cleansed and purged for God's great purpose. Until at last, at the end of human strength, beaten into the dust from which he came, 
the metal is ready for the maker's hand. That's good, thank you. And I don't know if I could make my message any more clear than that video. I hope you heard it okay. What you hear and what I hear are two totally different sound sets. Could everybody hear that okay? Other than it was 1956 audio, so it's the best we could do. But did you hear that very last part? To the wilderness where holy men and prophets are forged and purged. And ladies and gentlemen, I, I, that, 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 that living video that we just saw, that is a real season that each and every one of us goes through in our faith of feeling alone, a feeling abandoned, uh, a feeling dry, uh, a feeling like it's not going like we want it to go. And those are legitimate seasons we go through, and God is using that to work his purpose in our lives. Moses was in that wilderness for 40 years. He had one of the longest wilderness experiences of anybody. And when he was 40 years old, he became aware of his calling to be a deliverer. Maybe he knew it beforehand, but at age 40, we see him really taking steps to say, I'm the deliverer of my Hebrew brethren. <clears throat> but the problem was at age 40, he had too much passion and too much reliance on himself to the point where he would take justice into his own hands and kill somebody to try to bring about justice on his own. And as a result, God has him let go to the wilderness where he will spend 40 years on the backside of a desert. And you know what the Bible says about that time? Very little. He got married, <coughs> and he worked as a shepherd. That's it. That's all we know. And he came to the place where those 40 years of insignificance worked most of the Moses out of Moses. And it got, he got to the place where he gave up on his calling. He gave up on his dreams. And we know this because 40 years later, God appears to him in a burning bush and says it like the, just like the movie, Moses. And God appears to him and says, hey, Moses, it's time. And Moses is like, for what? Your dream, your vision, your calling. What? You're going to deliver Israel. Oh, that was a long time ago. I was a kid. I didn't. I'm happy here in this desert. Got all the sand. And he got to the place where he laid his dream, his vision, his calling down. And when he laid it down, God picked it up. Oh, my goodness gracious. And then, see, the 40 years, it worked the ambition out of him. Many times, many of us, ladies and gentlemen, every single one of us, I don't care how spiritual you are, how, how great you are, how much Bible you know, every single one of us has to go through that time because God has higher purposes in our life. And the reason is he takes us through is because he's trying to get the us out of us so it's more of him and less of us. Because if he gives, see, many of us, we get the dream we get the calling, we get the vision, and we think, okay, God, I'm ready now. And if you were to get it now, you would mess it up so bad. And, there were, and if it's not happening yet, it's not because it's not God's will. It's not because it's not you don't you, because you have the wrong dream. It's because it's the timing of God to have to work things in you to prepare you for the things that are to come. <coughs> uh, David. Now the Bible does not specifically tell us what age David was when 
when we first meet him in 1 Samuel. But when you start doing the math, we know he was 30 when he was anointed king. I, I believe he was 16 years old. He was somewhere between 16 and 19, maybe 15, when we have his first experience an encounter with, first, with Samuel, the prophet. David is a teenage boy, and here shows up a prophet at his house. Long story. He comes to David and says, hey, David. And David's like, yeah, how you doing? I'm, and he wasn't playing his Xbox. He was out working with the sheep. Come on in. And, and, and Samuel just pulls out a, a flask. that was called a horn, but we would call it a flask or a jar of oil, anointing olive oil. And he dumps it on his head. He says, hey, I'm anointing you king of Israel. Praise God, I'm the king. And do you know what happened to David as a result of being anointed king of Israel? About everything bad you could imagine. He would have every type of drama in his life. He would have family drama. His brothers would begin to turn on him. He, yeah, he would go a year later, slay Goliath. That would be great. King Saul would turn on him. His life would be hunted down like dogs. His wife would leave him. Many things happened to him. And even though 16 or 17 years old, and God says, you're king, he didn't realize it and see it until he was 30 years old. 12 to 14 years of waiting. Now you tell a teen, you know, you tell anyone, let alone a young person, hey, man, God, what, what, what if I prophesied to one of these young ladies today? You know, God says it's his will for you to have a husband. How many of those young ladies would be like, oh, who is it? I know how you young ladies do. You, every guy you meet, you say, does his last name work with my name? <laughs> and then you have to wait 14 years. Some of you singles know exactly what I'm talking about. Paul, the apostle Paul, had a tremendous conversion experience on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. We see right away he began to preach the gospel through Acts chapter 9, right around verse 26. And then something happens. He tries to join up with the disciples in Jerusalem, and they reject him. They weren't ready to receive him yet because of his former reputation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to be careful as Christians that when people come in from the outside, it's one of those things, it's a tough thing to do. You have to be wise as a serpent, yet innocent as a dove. Because we can't allow someone to come in and hurt the body, but at the same time, if someone genuinely is repentant, we have to give them a chance. Amen. Amen. So the disciples said, no, we, we, they rejected him. So the Bible tells us he goes home to his hometown, Sar uh, uh, Tarsus, and then through accounts of 1 Corinthians and, and Galatians, chapter 1 and 2, we see there was a 14 to 17 year delay between when Paul went to Tarsus and when his ministry became forefront ministry and when he really became the Paul that we know. And, and, and so there's so many other illustrations in the Bible. Uh, dreams. Hannah had a dream. She wanted a child. And year after year she prayed, oh God, give me a child. And year after year she was barren. Uh, Abraham had a dream. He wanted a child. Oh God, give me, a, give me a child. And year after year they came up empty. I know with Hannah... She asked God for a child. They went to the, made offerings for a child. She got to the place where she got so desperate in prayer 
She was mistaken for being drunk. She changed her prayer life and she changed her prayer. And she went from praying, God, give me a child. Listen, listen. God, give me a child. God, I'll give you a child. That is the purpose of the wilderness. To take out God, give me to God, I will give you. That the, the prodigal son, when he came back after those years of prodigal living, he came back and said, okay, Father, make me a servant. And when he said, make me a servant, the father said, no, you'll always be a son. I'm here to tell you today that there are the dreams and desires and callings and things God has put in your heart, and they are real. God put them there. You should be passionate. You should pray. But then there's a season of delay and denial and waiting, and it's not because God is randomly picking you to pick on. It's because God is working his greater purpose in you because instead of having you serve the dream, the dream is going to serve you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Many more I could share today. I need to be about done. I think you see this is going to be a good series. A lot to learn. Learning is fun, but then when we realize, oh, wait a second, you mean it's not all rose petals paths? In my office, one of my favorite things, my possessions, I have a bamboo replica, it's a fake, but it's a bamboo tree. I love the bamboo tree in my office. And here's why. When you plant a bamboo tree, I don't think you can, I don't know, I'm not a garden, a master gardener or some. I don't think you can get a bamboo tree to grow around here like they do in China. But there are certain Chinese bamboo trees that grow at the rate of 30 feet per year. That's impressive. Almost as fast as the grass around here during rainy season. <laughs> but if you were to plant that bamboo tree and go out there a year later, you may see that it may have broken the ground to come up as a little nub, maybe. And if you go back after year number two, you will see that your bamboo tree that's supposed to be growing at the rate of 30 feet per year is actually growing at the rate of one inch per year. And if you come back at year number three, your bamboo tree will be approximately two inches long. As a matter of fact, if you come back at year number four, you're going to think you've got the world's stupidest bamboo tree. <laughs> because it's still just a mere inches long. But something happens between years five and six. And that bamboo tree will begin to grow at the rate of 30 feet per year. Now, why did it take so long to take off? Well, here's why. As we saw above the soil a little nub, what we did not see was below the soil those roots growing down deep and wide and establishing a root system to a, that's going to support that much weight that's gonna be hit by wind and elements and animals are gonna climb in it, animals are gonna eat it. And if that bamboo tree had grown 30 feet the first year, the first time the wind came, it would have fallen right over. Ladies and gentlemen, those five years of significant insignificance are not to grow up, they are to grow down. And one of the, oh man, I just wish you'd let me preach someday. 
But you bunch of people. It says, you know, even the scripture says this. What it said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But I do want you to know, I'm not like the Apostle Paul. Paul preached so long one night, somebody fell asleep and it fell out of the window in the top story and fell over dead. They had to raise him from the dead. I've never done that yet, praise God. That's why we have a ground floor seating. Well, up, up there, I guess. So I want to be done with the message for right now. We're going to pick it up next Sunday. This Wednesday, I'm going to be teaching part two. You want to be here Wednesday. I'm teaching on honor. Uh, the culture of the kingdom is a culture of honor. And we've lost a sense of honor in our culture today that we need restored desperately. And then Wednesday, we feed you beforehand. If you can come here early, there's a free meal. I forget what the menu is. I think, it's, I think we're having ribeye steak with uh, baked potatoes and... Um, <laughs> Is that what we're having? Ribeyes? Por porterhouse. Porterhouses, okay. Filet mignons or something else. I don't know. Chili dogs, maybe. <laughs> so I'll be here Wednesday. But listen, I do want to share this. Um, I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come, our praise team to come. And before we leave today, I want to give you this opportunity. Um, just like that little girl I shared about today, and it was a very negative connotation in which someone told her if she washed her hands enough, the black would come off of her skin. That's terrible. But I also want you to know out there today, you were born after the nature of Adam and Eve, and that's called a sinful nature. And in that nature, no matter how much you try in your own human effort, you will never wash away the sin in your life. And only by Christ can you be saved from eternal judgment in a place called hell. There is a real hell. There is a real heaven. And I'm inviting you today that no one should walk out any of those doors without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're on your way to heaven by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. And if you say, Pastor Matt, yeah, that's me, I'm here today. Uh, let's just real quick, just because I want to, I, I don't want to, listen, I know, I know you got your pot roast to get to. Listen, we're having beans and I don't know what else today, but it's going to be good. It's in the crock pot. Can't wait to get to it. Hallelujah. But all that being said, Give me just 30 more seconds because I have every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're, you're here today and you say, Pastor, that's me. I need to give my heart to Jesus. I've tried my way all my life and I'm still full of sin. I'm still, I'm still not right with God. Would you raise your hand where you're at right now just long enough so I can see it? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can look up now. And, and, and just the one gentleman that's on this side over here, I, I just the Lord told me before the service, he said, it's, it, today's your day. He said, today's your day. And I, I met you before the service, and the Lord just really, I walked over here and told two or three people, I said, man, I just believe someone's going to give their heart to Jesus today, and, and that's for you today. I just want you to know everything I did today was for you. And it's for the rest of us, but if, if I ministered to anybody today, it was for you, my brother, and I'm so glad you're here, and I just cannot wait to see how God's plan unfolds in your life. I'm so proud of you. This church is proud of you. This is your new family. This is your new family. This is your new family, sir, right here. This is your new family. These are your brothers. These are your sisters, and we welcome you into our family today. And we believe God's plan for your life is wonderful. Stick around and find out what God wants to do in you and through you. Amen. And for those two gentlemen, I want to invite you. I want to dismiss for the sake of time, but I want to invite you two to please come forward and pray with one of these prayer partners. They want to lead you in the prayer of salvation, and they want to pray over you and believe God with you for God to work in your life and to help you take the very next steps of your faith as a newborn Christian. So. Amen. That's wonderful. Let me pray over everybody. The praise team will sing and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you today. We bless you. 
I thank you for the living word of God that is powerful and that truth working victory in our lives today. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And as we go, we go in your blessing, with your protection, your provision, and we seek to honor you in all we do. And Lord, in your name we pray. Amen. Well, hi there. I'm Pastor Matt. I just want to take this moment and say thank you so much for tuning in to the ministry of Soul Harvest Church Online. And it's a privilege to minister to you each and every time. And I just want to invite you to be a living and active part of our vision to touch the world from West Central Indiana. And if you've been blessed by our ministry, I would ask you to very strongly consider sowing into our ministry to provide that our ministry would continue to go deeper and wider to impact people just like you all around this world that cost the precious blood of Jesus. So I would appreciate a gift of any amount. And, and I would ask if you're on YouTube, click the link below. If you're online on our website, click uh, Give Online. Or if you're on our app, hit the Give Online tab, and it'll take you through a couple easy steps, and you'd be able to sow. And we just pray God's richest blessing on you today. Thank you. God is good. His word is true. And it works in your life, friend.